Edward I was King of England for 35 years, from 1272 to 1307. He's the fifth of 14 Plantagenet kings who ruled England between 1154 and 1485. The son of Henry III and grandson of King John, who we covered in previous videos. He's best known for bringing the Welsh under English rule, and for having Scottish leader William Wallace, the subject of Mel Gibson's 1995 very, very historically accurate film Braveheart, executed, and for expelling all Jews from England. An edict that would only be officially overturned under Oliver Cromwell's some 350 years later. He's here in our timeline, his rule beginning 750 years before the current King Charles III inherited the throne of England. Edward was born in 1239. At that point, his father Henry III had been king for 23 years. If this seems like a long time, bear in mind Henry had been crowned when he was just nine. A powerful, well-built fellow at six foot two, Edward was nicknamed Edward Longshanks, a reference to his long legs. When he was 15, his father married him off to Eleanor of Castile, and he would have 15 children with her, nine of which tragically died in childhood. His eldest surviving son Edward, who would inherit the crown as Edward II, was the last of his children with Eleanor. In 1258, his father Henry III was forced to sign the Provisions of Oxford, constitutional reforms designed to limit his powers. But by the mid-1260s, the English barons had got it into their heads that he was about to reclaim these powers. The barons revolted. Led by the powerful Earl of Leicester, Simon de Montford, the rebels declared war on the king. Prince Edward, by then a powerful warrior, was captured at the Battle of Lewis in 1264. Incredibly though, the burly prince escaped and killed de Montfort at the Battle of Evesham in 1265. The rebellion over, Prince Edward set off to join the Ninth Crusade in 1268, the latest attempt to capture Jerusalem, leading a military campaign but almost falling victim to a Syrian assassin. Finally, in 1272, his father, King Henry III, died and Edward was king. If you're enjoying this video, please hit the like button. Each uptick helps us make new episodes. Please also subscribe if you haven't done so already. If you're feeling generous, you can also help us by becoming a Patreon. See the link below. Though he was a tough warrior, Edward I was also a wise ruler. Having seen firsthand the disasters his father's misrule had brought about, he realised that the first thing he had to do was unite the kingdom. During his father's weakened directionless reign, the Welsh leader Llywelyn ap Griffith had extended control over most of Wales. Previously, Wales had been a separate country, with princes who would pay homage to the English. Edward reversed this, conquering the Welsh and building a series of fortresses, effectively putting a military occupation in place. The king then turned his attentions to Scotland, initially trying to place his six-year old son Edward, the future Edward II, on the throne through marriage. Seven-year-old Margaret, the King of Norway's daughter, was the sole surviving heir to the Scottish King Alexander III's throne. The totally normal plan of making two children marry one another in order to satisfy the King of England's lust for ruling Scotland was thwarted, however, when Margaret died in 1290 in Orkney, which then, of course, was part of Norway. All this didn't stop Edward I, who decided that his man, a nobleman called John Balliol, would sit on the Scottish throne instead. Balliol, an anglicised Scot, was crowned King of Scotland in 1292. Despite this, Edward treated him as an inferior and acted as if he was the real ruler. He even humiliated Balliol by summoning him to Westminster. Eventually, the Scots had enough and revolted. King Edward, definitely not slapping his hands together in delight because he finally had something interesting to do, marched on Scotland and crushed the Scots at Berwick, Dunbar and Edinburgh, acquiring a new name, the Hammer of the Scots. For 400 years, Scottish kings had been crowned sitting on the mystical Stone of Schoon. Edward stripped Balliol of his kingly regalia and stripped Scotland of its stone. No longer would Scottish kings be crowned, sitting on the stone of destiny. Instead, Edward had it hauled off to London and placed it under the coronation throne in Westminster Abbey. From now on, only English kings would be crowned sitting on top of it. The stone would remain there for 700 years, only being taken back to Scotland in 1996. Following his victory over the Scots, Edward then turned his attentions towards France, summoning Parliament to help him raise taxes for an invasion. The problem was, guerrilla resistance broke out in Scotland, led by the freedom fighter William Wallace, meaning the king now faced war on two fronts. To appease the nobles, as costs rose, Edward reissued Magna Carta and pressed on. William Wallace was captured, brought to London, and, as per Mel Gibson's film, executed in a brutal fashion. Wallace immediately became a martyr, and the Scots rallied round a new leader, Robert the Bruce, who had himself crowned King of Scotland in 1306. Robert the Bruce would prove a formidable enemy, and harried the English on the Scottish border. Edward I, the Hammer of the Scots, was forced once more to set off north with his army. But before he reached the battlefront, the 68-year-old king died. His body was carried back to Westminster Abbey, where he was buried. His 23-year-old son, who we'll cover in our next video, was crowned King Edward II later that year.